And today, uh, we, we are going to cover mainly two topics, but we'll start with something that I felt uh, we didn't cover uh, good enough uh, la last uh, um, talk. So we'll start with NGS, technology and quality, uh, just to share with you a few ideas that I think sometimes are just uh, overlooked and I think are, are critical. And then we'll talk about uh, gene code and about RefSec, and uh, probably we'll do some illustration so you feel, you, you know what we are going to look at. So uh, I don't think we have uh, much time for uh, some extra, but we'll do it um, slowly. We'll go o over it. So let's start with uh, NGS technology, but this time I won't talk much about technology because we can read it in uh, Wikipedia, you can read it anywhere. But I want to uh, mention the aspect of biological consideration for NGS that you as a biologist, most of you probably are familiar with, but uh, we tend not to talk about it, but actually it, uh, th those aspects are extremely important. So this is just a, a view, overview saying, just to say that NGS is very diverse and there are many solutions of how to use NGS. And as we say last time, NGS is a bad name for parallel sequencing, which is a better name, or deep sequencing, which tells us something about the, 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 the amounts and coverage that we are talking about. So I'll keep NGS because that became stabilized, but actually I don't like this word. Anyway, but I just uh, uh, mentioned a list of machines or technology. They are very different from each other, each of them really has its own application. And it's important to match the application to the uh, uh, technology, okay? So uh, um, this, you can see anything, but what I want to, s to say with these unseen pictures on purpose, that once you have a problem, biological problem, you have to match the needs, the, the, the solution, and then you can really zoom in saying, okay, I'm interested in microRNA, I'm interested in small coverage of all genome or whatever, then you can fit the right solution to the right uh, question. So uh, this is taken from one of those uh, companies that really try to navigate you, and it's quite important to know how to match because a lot of, many, many times, you just have in your uh, uh, genomic center next door something that is always using the same technology, but o o it can be, and often it does, uh, the c it is the case that it's not the right technology to the right, to, the, to your own question. So beware about this step. That's point one that I want to share. Then point two that is more important for, for this discussion is just an, as an example. Let's say that you are working on DNA, and we will work quite a lot on DNA. So you start with, by extraction DNA. This is done really easily. Everybody did it at some lab. You know, you have those nice string that comes from the ethanol. So this is the DNA. Then you break it, never mind exactly how. And then you do some size selection. Size selection are either by some t type of size averaging or by gel. So you can really cut whatever you want and that's really important. So that's I think most of you nod in their head which is a good sign that you, you know what I'm talking about. Excluding Nadav by the way. So anyway, uh, so the, the, the one thing that I think often is not, that there is not enough emphasis on is that there is a fun fundamental difference between anything that you do on genome and everything that you do, let's say, on transcriptome. And this is the notion of completion. So without going into too much details, you understand that if you do genome, the same genome, 100 times, eventually you'll get the same result, or supposed to get the same result. And if you don't, it's probably a machine uh, problem, chemistry problem, and so on. So it's really a technical aspect. But if you do transcriptome, it's a completely different story because transcriptome, by definition, is hooked to a condition, time, temperature, and so on and so forth, tissue, a, a morning or evening, and so on. So it's very, very sensitive to those aspects. 
So there is no transcriptome completion. The transcriptome is defined by time, condition, procedure, and so on. So be aware for this because often it's, no one talks about it, but when you analyze transcriptome, there is this notion of incomplete uh, uh, set, okay? That's, uh, and when you do transcriptome, you, do, uh, you have usually two different uh, main, not uh, exclusively, but main uh, direction. One is comparative. You have, uh, uh, you, you, you have breakfast and didn't have breakfast. You take your blood and you compare. How is breakfast affecting my uh, white blood cell? Okay, that's one comparative. The other is discovery. And discovery is also extremely uh, interesting because often you can just get a transcriptome from new genome without even a, a genome, new organism, new condition and so on. And you can go to, I don't know, to the coral reef, take something, crush it, make RNA, and then realize new biology, completely something that you haven't uh, uh, looked at or you haven't even anticipated. So uh, uh, transcriptome is really a fantastic way to get very interesting, new, exciting biology. In, in, in addition to the comparative. So this is something that uh, you should know with the remind that you never have a really complete story because you happen to take it at that time, at that day, with these hands, two hands, okay? So it's very sensitive, actually. Okay. The last point for NGS uh, uh, part of the talk is about sampling co quality. Usually what happens is that you will get the data and we'll discuss it in, in the example that I'll go through. But the data came from some sample, from some biological preparation. And there is a lot of knowledge, as many of you are familiar with, a lot of sensitivity to how you prepared this DNA or these molecules, it could be RNA, microRNA, a, a ribosomal RNA, never mind, how you did it. So sample. As I said, it's most important, but there is no glory there. You just have to do it right. So when I say no glory, I mean that there are many procedures of how to prepare, in this case, your RNA, for example. But each procedure, as I mentioned for the methodology, comes with limitation, benefits, and drawbacks. So for example, I just give the most common use example that you are familiar with, when you isolate, let's say, RNA from a PrEP, could be yeast, uh, human cells, whatever, or cell line, and you do a poly-A tail uh, extraction for your RNA, definitely you'll get, uh, uh, this is a very complex, but I think many of you are familiar with this procedure. How many actually did sometimes RNA PrEP for one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so, so not all of you, but it's something that it's pretty routine, I would say. But when you do it, you have set of, it's like a menu, you know, you, set, you have to go through many uh, different uh, uh, steps. And then it's very sensitive whether your enrichment for the RNA have been based on poly-A just to remind, poly A, the tail of most, but not all, uh, uh, transcript. Or you did it from the other side of the game by uh, uh, capturing the cap, which is the protecting agent, a, a nucleotide on the five prime. Or you did it by some kind of enrichment for modification or by any other means of random priming. I mean, each and every uh, uh, step here define a different outcome. And then you start working on it, and the outcome will be dependent exactly on this. You should never forget what you started with. And just as an illustration, the quality is super important. I just give you two, just look at the, at the uh, bottom part, which is two different level of quality of RNA, usually in the lab, because RNA is pretty expensive to prepare, you do it and you are happy you have it and you keep going. But if you kept going with this 
relatively low quality on the right side. And why it's low quality? Because you can see the two nice uh, band of the ribosomal RNA that are all marked for the preparation. And you see a lot of degradation. So all this uh, hill is a degraded part of the game. Look at this. Same preparation, but higher quality. You have this very nice uh, uh, two uh, uh, ribosomal RNA as a hallmark for the preparation. And then you can have, so if you just do this or that, you'll get a different result quite uh, 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 often. And this is the last uh, uh, slide on this uh, section, just to show that what, what I show you here is, let's say it's a transcript, you know, like a prototype of a transcript, and you did poly A. And what you see here is, are the reads of the NGS where they are aligned. So now it's clear why they are aligned from this mostly here, because you started from here. So if you are looking for something here, forget about it. And if the transcript is long, really forget about it. And if you have here a very interesting uh, uh, splicing, alternative splice, you won't see it. So whatever you come is really dependent on what you do. Never mind, almost never mind, how deep you are doing it. How what is the level of coverage? Because often you won't get to the right side of the. So this is important point. Whenever you do transcriptome, think about the methodology that you start and the limitation by technology. Okay, end of story. So sample quality is very important, and. Uh, uh, NGS is, is pretty good. The technology now on NGS really try to overcome this limitation that I just mentioned. I won't uh, give you the exact uh, uh, res result how you do it. Next uh, part of this talk is about biological database and how we get really, if, let's put all this problem aside, forget about them for now, and let's go to the uh, database because we want to to, to, to learn how to use them, how to benefit from the enormous collection of the word uh, collection of uh, uh, molecular entities. So let's say my question is, where can I find my favorite gene, my favorite uh, transcript, my favorite uh, chromosome, whatever, okay? So today I'll talk about two of those resources. One is a gene code which is based on ENCODE, so I'll give you a little bit of history just to understand that it's not just coming from somewhere, but there is an history, quite fast history, because we are talking about 15 years or so, no more than that, but it's a fast history that brings us to the place where we are, which is very, very exciting time. Okay, and then we'll uh, demonstrate RefSec. So ENCODE, what's ENCODE? ENCODE is a project that was initiated in 2003 with the idea that we have to understand what's the junk DNA. Now, the junk DNA, namely everything that we do not understand. Or in other words, let's take the, the uh, 20,000 genes that we know of, kind of, and let's go and understand how they regulate, why they are on, why they are off, what's going on in all the aspect of regulatory science, regulatory molecular entity for genome. Very prestigious, I mean, like, uh, it's, it's, it's also very courageous to think that you can get something uh, um, out of it. But the idea was that really we want to understand disease, really, the, I mean, that's the idea in the uh, agenda of ENCODE. We really want to understand disease, therefore we must understand regulation. We cannot just understand properly the gene themselves coming out of nothing because we, under, we, we must understand the level of regulation up and down, what's exposed, what's not exposed, and to understand who is controlling all this. So all this junk DNA was uh, 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 the idea for ENCODE. Now briefly, the ENCODE, the name is for the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, and as I said, 2003, and the goal is to find functional element and the word functional element remained very, very vague at that time, 
not only gene, not only enhancer, not only promoter, something. Okay. And what uh, I like in this uh, project is uh, maybe two things that I think it's, it's important to share with you. First, that it was when they uh, uh, announced it, they decided on about 20 type of biological validation scheme. So no one comes with his own kind of clever idea to understand. Let's go split it between many labs, many. Each of them will do their own expertise on one of the 20 different methodology, combine it and share it to the public and make it with the database. And so it was, a, a, I would say, a prototype, a very clever prototype to understand how to build database that it's by definition quite complex because we are talking about regulation with a very many undefined uh, uh, entity. Going back to the point of completeness, not completeness, it's not an easy task. So the idea is to do, uh, to define a, a functional unit and I'll just tell you one way to define it. There, there are many uh, alternative ways. So uh, one can define, let's say, the, the genome to start annotated by a location, saying this is cytosolic, this is nuclear, this is mitochondria, and so on. The other alternative is to say whether the genome is split to coding and non-coding. Okay, so that that's makes sense to separate. And in the coding, you can have the genes and you can have proteins or RNA. In the non-coding, you can have a repeated DNA that actually occupy most of our genome and then sp uh, se separate. And in the non-coding, you have all those units, intron, regulo, uh, regulator, promoter, and so on. So this is more like a functional annotation of what is there. But you can do also by molecular composition, say, let's split it to RNA and non-RNA, and so on. So the, 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 the decision was to go with this genome annotation that I showed you on the, on the screen. And this is just a more, a more illustrative way to what type of experiment were done in order to understand the genome. And it's, it's, it's quite amazing, actually, where that one can organize this with hundreds of, or tens, let's say, of very leading labs. All of them really uh, uh, tune themselves to do this exactly. So one lab, for example, had to do the RNA-seq, or few labs. The other had to do a CHIP-seq. CHIP-seq means a IP, immunoprecipitation, of one of the transcription factors. Who is bounding, uh, what part is bound to this transcription factor? The other people uh, uh, got to do the 5C, you know, the, the, the chromosome organization in space. V very interesting, but I won't have time to, to deal with it. So. Everything was done and, and the uh, uh, annotation had gone deeply into the genome itself. Where is the sensitive sites for cleavage? Where is the transcription fa factor binding sites? Where is enhancer and so on and so forth? The end of the day, this is a summary of the ENCODE, and from that I'll move to gene code. But the ENCODE uh, uh, showed us Something quite interesting, and uh, I must say that I like this uh, slide because it tells us something that I, th I don't think it's so intuitive to many of us. So for example, this is, let's say, the genome already covered or colored by its annotated entities, okay? So all those repetitive 21% with the sign line 34, so third, of, the pro of, of our genome are those that we understand very little and there is very little data about them. Then you have a retrovirus, vi retrovirus like and then you have transposome like and then you have fossil and so on. We already got to 53% of our genome with basically zero understanding or just history fossil of what happened in the evolution of human race somehow. I mean, really, this, to tell you the truth, in terms of science, I think this occupied 1% of science, although it's 53% of human genome. And then you go to the more, let's say, unique parts. This is the repeated parts, and that's the unique. 
And then you see that the introns, that usually we say, OK, let's skip the intron and let's talk about the gene, the, the, the really transcript. This is the, the intron, most of the stuff, right? And then you have the, the, the gene and, and so on. And you have not yet sequence, another 10%. So everything that we'll talk about this in this class, or not, not entirely in this class, is somehow in this part of the coding within this human genome, or when we are talking about genes and so on. But you'll see that uh, it, it's very important to understand this uh, kind of composition of the, of, the, of the story. OK. So ENCODE, uh, uh, just uh, for, uh, to wrap up the historical point of view, started by decision to take 1% of the genome and do everything that I showed you. And if successful, let's move on. So it was a pilot for a couple of years, and the pilot was super successful, really. And then this is the summary what happened in the second phase, second phase that took another five years. Really, uh, uh, as I said, 4,400 scientists co collaborated in this uh, game, 31 labs, and 24 different experiments that were combined to tell us what we know about any piece of this genome. Okay. And the most important is that the data was released every night and so on, so it was really accessible to the public. That was very exciting. So this is just uh, illustrating of one thing that came out of this. So for example, by computational and bioinformatics uh, tools, one can say what is the binding site of specific transcription factor that was and where they are. So immediately you can ask quantitative Python-like questions. How is it enriched? in the genome. I'm just throwing you a question to put you in the thinking of what one can think of quantitative thinking by having this information. Is it spread? Is it cluster? Are those spread in the repeated region or not? What's the distance between those elements? How far is it from a start of a, a transcription? How far is it from end of transcription? What happened to the uh, a complement side of it, and so on and so forth. A lot of quantitative questions by the tools that you are going to, to have. So this is just to bring you to, to the mode of thinking that you can ask questions once you have such type of data. And very elegant question that really understand, to, to let us understand biology in a different quantitative way that usually we don't put so much uh, effort on. So, so this is kind of an educational uh, tour. So uh, the, the, the one I, I'll stop here because the one thing that uh, they learned that, for example, the, the essence of what an a enhancer was totally mysterious before. What are the really an enhancer? How, how many do we have? Where they are, they are located? Who are they? So, so this beca became really the source for such type of questions. OK. And, and many other. So, this, uh, the success of this ENCODE led to a new project that is called GeneCode. And GeneCode, as all a, a project, first of all, and this is why I wrote it there, it has to be assigned with a specific release and time of release because it's frozen for each and every release and then another jump to another release. So as I said, this release that is now uh, uh, the, gene the current gene code is called release 32 and is assigned with a specific genome that we already understand that it's 38 version P13. Okay, so you have a really, uh, you can assign gene code with the current knowledge of the genome. Okay, so gene code is a project for integrated annotation of gene features and uh, uh, it is run by people in, uh, um, in England, in UK, in the Wellcome Trust, just to give you in parenthesis, Wellcome Trust, a, a Sanger Institute, is the institute where all the 1,000 genome have been made, where all the ensemble, which is one of the most uh, powerful tool, is, is carried on and so on. So it's a very, very strong bioinformatics genomics center maybe the best in the world in terms of production and 
and putting it in, in, in place for human, not, not necessarily for other organisms. Yeah. Okay, so the goal of gene code is to identify and classify all gene feature in the human and mouse only. Namely human for, of course, a, a trivial a, a reason, but mouse <coughs> being the most important, let's say, model system for understanding humans, so they did it in parallel at the same quality, by the way. So it's very, very nice. And it's shared by all. So historical, up to release 25, I mentioned that we are now 32. Each element was a, a sign with some kind of quality or, or, or let's say a, a, how, how much we know about the gene. We are talking about gene code. It's a gene as a unit. It was written with known, novel, putative, or known by projection. They decide to declare it completely. So be sensitive that no, this is no, no, no anymore that you can say, show me only the known or only the unknown. Forget it. So this is gone. A and it's important because a lot of uh, uh, papers and a lot of are starting by saying, we analyze the known genes and it's not anymore valid. So uh, this is gone. Um, now it's supported by RefSec that, that became very good that I'll come in a minute. So there is no need for that. And this is just to show you what is the gene code current status in terms of numbers. Now it's just a, a, a screenshot. So protein coding genes, we already know that we have 20,000. And indeed, this is, this is by the way, I, th I took it from 2017, but it's updated quite uh, on, only slightly. But look at this, I don't know how many of you are familiar and I want to, to spend a, a, a minute on this because I think, again, I, I try to touch point that I know that a lot of people are thinking differently and I want to put you on, on really being completely updated on, on the numbers, on, on the situation that is happening today. So the total number, official total number, but gene code is 60,000. Why? 20,000 are really coding genes that we tend to talk about quite a lot. However, I don't know how many of you are familiar that there is 16,000 genes of known coding. This is known coding RNA. Now they are expressed, they are processed, they have intron, everything is good. But we know very little about them. Their expression is embarrassingly low on average. So it was a little bit below the, the carpet unless till NGS start to do a very deep uh, uh, transcriptome and then, then they jump, but it wasn't one or two. We are talking about the same number <laughs> that we have for coding. This is quite uh, shocking. Now, another shocking is maybe to know that the small known coding are really 8,000 of them. And why it's shocking? They are so small that often they were not even sequenced in the transcriptome because they don't have poly A. Forget about them. No one looked at them. It's, 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 it's shocking. And why? And also because they are short, they, they only occupied very small part of the genome. So they never really affected saying, well, we are missing 20%. They, they just went unnoticed. And this is v super important. Yes, you please. Yeah, so for example, I mentioned it very slightly, just saying when you do, for example, gel separation of, of uh, broken parts, you say, let's take everything up to a size of 200. Bingo, you look there and you, you see that you, you, you have something that you never looked at. And I'm really going back only 10 years ago or 15. So this is really a new kind of a type of gene of genes that we don't talk about them as genes because they are not coding, but they are as important and as powerful for regulation and so on. And other things that I could make a, a, a guess that many of you are not familiar is the fact that we have 10,000 genes that are pseudogenes and they are expressed. So when you do a transcriptome, you see them. It's not just a leftover in the, in the genome without being expressed and being processed. If you want, 
in the, towards the end of the class, you can come back to me with this question, what they are doing, why they are there, and so on. I, I don't have the time now to discuss it, but it's, it's, it, it's a very important component, bo both from qu quantity and from the type of uh, new thinking that we have to do. Altogether, this is another list saying that the total number of transcripts in the human genome is 200,000. Uh, 200, so why is it four times more than the total number of genes? Sorry? For example, because each gene not may have, often have more than one transcript, which is legitimate one, okay? So that, that's exactly, uh, uh, it's a, an important uh, uh, addition. And again, the, the, this, you, you look later, and this is just a, a from last night, I see that there is another 10% addition to the number of transcript, not to the number of genes, by the way. Okay, yes, please. Good, good, good question. So now you understand. I, I, I wanted to put you to exactly to ask those questions because without understanding this, you do not understand the complexity of the issue. So now you have to come with decisions, with coordinated task saying, should we put all transcripts that are coming from the same physical genome a, a location in the same a name and then just define the variants as sub-edition of this? And the answer is that was what happened. Initially, it was different, but uh, RefSec exactly trying to do this, to provide a reference for a gene, for a gene transcript or gene protein and so on. But it's a, it's a critical question because all this, uh, what we are discussing comes, you know, it's nailed down to a lot of these decisions that makes it usable for computational and for Python people and so on. Otherwise, it's a mess, right? Of course, and th that's exactly, uh, your question really leads me exactly to the idea that we want to share here. So again, this is a very interesting number. Uh, I just have to say that what I show you here, without going to too much details here, is that the bio, the, it's called biotype. Biotype means what type of molecules is it? And the biotypes, you would think protein coding and non-coding are two major biotypes, but you have many more, and I won't elaborate, but uh, it's, it's important to know that the biotype define quite a lot of uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, combination of genes. So, related to your question, when they say small non-coding RNA, they have to define what biotype are included. This, 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 and this. So, each and every one is a combination of biotypes that is one-to-one -one defined. So you cannot be there and there, okay? So that's an important point, and this is just illustration, okay? And of course, uh, as you see, <laughs> the, the, the devil is in the details, where mitochondria, should we put it as a small or large? And so, so it's a predefined set, okay? mitochondria, ribozymes, all kind of weird biology is going into those decisions. Okay, and uh, just uh, to, to finish, it's a, uh, it's a fully coordinated gene, uh, uh, gene code with uh, ensemble. And two, two things that uh, I want to show you that uh, will, you, you'll see it all together, all, all, all around this class. Ensemble is, again, I, I, there is another talk about ensemble, so I don't uh, want to, to say too much. But ensemble is the code when you uh, want to talk about a gene from gene code, you'll get also ensemble a, a index, which start with ENS. And if it's a mouse, it's ENS musculus, okay? If it's a human, it's only ENS. And the G say that we are talking about the gene. If it would be T, it would be transcript. If it would be an E, it would be an exon all the unit. If it would be a P, it's the protein and so on. So by looking at this, you already know what you are looking at. Then you have 11 a number and then version. Okay, so, so you have a, a way, a, a fast way to understand what you are looking at already. Okay, and so uh, uh, I'll, I'll skip this and I'll just say that uh, uh, the, the gene code 
has a very uh, restricted format that we'll, we'll see an example in a minute, which called uh, T, uh, GTF, which is a general transfer format. And the, the format is, is uh, I'll give you an example. So uh, I it's very important, but the format has to be, again, it comes with two levels of annotation. One is Avana. Avana is a group of curator, very good curator that go manually and say, check, okay, not true. So when you see Avana, you know that it's a high quality without, you don't have to say it's a high quality. It's Avana approved, okay? So, and the other is the ensemble approved, which is more like uh, automatic pipeline. So when you look at the gene, you have already a, a notion if it's a Havana proofed, which means very good quality and somebody really see it and, and, or ensemble uh, uh, proofed. Uh, I'll just say that the code, uh, I don't know, sh should I go into it or you go? You, okay, okay, so, so should I? So let's skip it because it's in your exercise. And then um, I'll just say the last thing about gene code and move to the uh, ref, RefSec is that many, many excellent, really excellent resources that some of them will happen to meet during this class are using gene code as their set of genes as a reference. So the gene code provide the set and all of them, I, I won't go one by one, are using this as a, as a, as a reference, okay? So this is important to know that it's not just a side uh, walk, everything is connected to this. And uh, I'll, I'll skip the, the uh, what's good database, but I want to mention that in the, now that we are moving to uh, uh, understand what's a RefSec and so on, uh, there are two types of database in this world of molecular database. One is a primary database. Primary means that you just finish an experiment and you want to publish it in nature and nature tell you you cannot unless you put your data in the GEO or in the NCBI or in, okay? This become a routine. So it's not if you want it or not, it's the, the collection of, we call it primary resource. This is really often raw data which has, it's, it's a treasure. Right, because usually you do your paper, you move on to work in the uh, iTech, and then all these million of dollars and effort and hours are staying for you to use. So it's it's really a very useful resource. This is the primary. The, the 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 drawback that it's a big mess often. It's a big mess because there is a huge redundancy. There is a huge but but it's all formatted by any of those acceptor, those units that takes your data, they won't let you throw your data unless you format it in a specific way. So the mess is not in the way the data looks like, but in the redundancy level and quality as we discuss. So that's important. The derived, uh, derivative database are more important to our discussion because those are organized by a third party that takes this, reduce the redundancy, throw the garbage, and do something that is useful to the community as a reference. There are many derived uh, uh, database. For example, uh, uh, many of them are very important. RefSec is one of them, and we'll uh, mention it, but, but there are many more. So I put the list so for you to know if you need homologs and so on to know where to go. So it's, it's, it's a good uh, resource. And this is your science and this is curated science. Okay, so it's really different uh, uh, way to look at it. So the uh, uh, RefSec, uh, just from uh, location, it's done, we moved from Europe to Trump, uh, uh, to USA. And now we are at NCBI at uh, uh, really, uh, well, I won't say because it's recorded, but it's a very strange place to say it uh, nicely. Uh, 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 in uh, Batesta, in nowhere, and then huge amount of effort in NCBI to coordinate, organize, and do derivat der der derivative database at the highest quality ever, and to provide beautiful portals to get there. 
So really use it. So uh, um, this is, uh, we already uh, discussed about it. So let's uh, talk about uh, uh, the gene bank is a primary database. Primary means everything is thrown in. And this is the source for RefSec. So RefSec is taken from uh, gene bank. Gene bank, just to say that it's not only US and a, a, a UK or a Europe, but it's also a third party that is part of this gene bank, which is the Japanese, that have a, a phenomenal genomics data and molecular data, extremely high quality. So the three uh, uh, collaboration of the European, of the US, and of uh, uh, Japanese are ended up co uh, uh, combined into the gene bank. And the gene bank, uh, I, I told you this, uh, I'll, I'll go faster on this. Uh, uh, now you have to do something that will be non-redundant. And the one a very important part of the non-redundancy is really to do it at the DNA level, at the protein level. And RefSec do both. So what's RefSec? Let me show you, maybe I'll do it uh, live, uh, it will be uh, easier. Um, I'll, I'll show you an example. And maybe just, this is by the way, example of not RefSec, but a gene, uh, can we do it? Okay, let's see. So I just took one, one gene that I kind of like. Uh, it's a very interesting gene, basically. Uh, and this, this gene is called the Lynx1. Do you know something about it? Probably not. It's a very small one, very, but it's part of the immune system of a, 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 a very uh, interesting uh, type of... Uh, so if you go to nucleotide and you go to NCBI and you are in the resources of NCBI, you can see that we are at Homo sapiens and Lynx1. I just write the uh, Lynx1 and you get it. And you have 20 tw 22 ver version of Lynx1. But we want to go to the RefSec, which is, as I'm, I didn't say it uh, explicitly, but it's a reference for the gene. And when you go there, you see that it has only four version. This is the number of nucleotide. This is the number of amino acid. As you see, no difference in the amino acids, but quite s small differences in the size. Can somebody tell me why the, the, the nucleotide is different than, although the protein is the identical, there, is, there are four versions that are different? UTRs. Sorry? UTRs. Yeah, exactly. So the UTRs, RefSec, uh, uh, allow the exon and intron to be perfect, but allows the tails to be a little bit flexible, but still it has only one RefSec select. And this is the, this one. So RefSec will tell you that this is the primary representative of Lynx1, okay? So when you go there, you'll see uh, uh, already two things that I want to mention, is how, how is the index built? What is the index? The index always, is N because we are in nucleotide, M because we are at mRNA, and then underscore and the number, point, and a version. Okay? So a little bit like I said before, if we go to, uh, this is the transcript and this is the protein. The protein is the same. It's the nucleotide and the protein and its number. So if we go to this transcript, that just as a, for illustration, you see, and what I show you here is the same that you'll see, never mind which, if you are in GeneBank or in RefSec. So the format is very, very uh, strict. And what's the format tells us? First of all, this, you see. Then you have FASTA and graphics. FASTA means the DNA, the, the, the sequence, in a very, very textual, elementary uh, version. You, 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 you have a lot of this in the exercise, so I don't want. But now you have the locus. Locus is a very important point because it tells us exactly the locus is this. As you see, it's not the variant. It's just the locus. This is the, the, the uh, number of base pair. It's a mRNA, but you already knew it because of the name, right? 
and it was updated primary in September 2019, which means that every automatically there is an update and going through PubMed, through, going through a lot of primary data to revise this list. So whenever you are in this list, usually you will see something from 2009, not because the gene was found in 2009, only what is the last time of its updates, okay? And the updates could be added one PubMed very important paper, okay? So now you have the definition. It's an Homo sapiens, this is the name, and it's variant one of mRNA. You have the, the, the version, 0.4, that we already talked about. The source is human. The organism, you have exactly the taxonomy, all the taxonomy. Then you have the reference, the authors, the title, and so on. I'll, I, move, I move, those are the selected papers that contribute to the knowledge. And it's not just an exhaustive a list, it's a selected list. And then you go to features, or maybe before, to the primary. Uh, uh, and the, uh, let, let's skip this. Uh, uh, here is a, a, a comment. And you have, the comment are super important. Why? Because the comment tells you, for example, that we took it from here, we combined it here, and there is one nucleotide that we don't know about, right? So you have all the evidence based. Because when you see it, you want to know, is it the one and only, what procedure they did in order to present it here? You have it in comment. And you have the most important part from our uh, point of view and the, the class as it goes, is this feature that tells you that the source, as we already know, is four to one to 4,000 and so on. It's the molecular type is mRNA. The, the taxon is a human, which is the taxonomy index for human. The chromosome is here. The mapping of the chromosome, as you know, the chromosome is also has a low resolution type of presentation. And the, this is the gene. This is alternative name for the genes. And this is external reference. We call it cross-reference, which means that the same information is duplicated and cross-reference. And usually, if now I'm saying something on the bioinformatics part, if you really want to go to a good resources, go from here. Because this is the quality tag saying this is the good resources, including the, the, the mouse and so on. I know that we are uh, short in time, but you can see the translated version of it, right? Starting with methionine and so on. You have a signal peptide, which is a feature that is part of it by applying method saying what happened, does it have this, 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 and this, right? So you have external expert, usually it's an automated uh, version that tells you, yes, this protein has a, a very interesting uh, a signal peptide. It has a mature or not mature protein. You know, protein can be processed, right? So it can be cleaved. So what after the cleavage, what will happen really in the real cellular context and so on. So, and then you have exactly how it is built. This guy is only two, three exons. So you have two intron and three exons. So exactly you have the composition of the genes and it's 4,000 uh, nucleotides, right? From the beginning to end. This is the, the page that RefSec tells you, this is the primary sequence that we believe is the one and what, the, what, what does it mean, we believe? Usually they take the longer, the most annotated, and they have some kind of a, they, they like to call it the, 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 uh, uh, the oracle, the takes sequence and the, you go by the oracle. Is it this on this? You close your eyes, okay, it's this, and, the, and so on. End up being the version that everybody is using because this is a reference. The one point that is super important to remember, I have it in the PowerPoint, but because of time, I, I, I'll say it uh, just uh, uh, without showing the demonstration, is that RefSec is not connected to the genome. It's a unit. So its coordinates are not by the na where it started and where it ends in the chromosome, right? Well, again, this is a, a, an important point. It's, of course, the gene is 
from a specific location, right? But when you go to the data here, you won't see that it's connected to, it's, it's a unit by itself. It's cut and explained everything about it. So, so that if, for example, the, u the genome will be changed because somebody added another 50 nucleotide, it won't affect this specific gene, uh, RefSec, right? So the RefSec is a unit. You, you have to think about it as a, as a, as a really unit a little bit out of context, now the RefSec itself, and now I'll just um, go to, uh, I hope, okay, just go to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, another point of how you look at the accession number of RefSec. Uh, I talked about this, right? The mRNA, which is NM, NP, and NR, it's the known coding genes that I already discussed quite a lot about. Okay, and then you have XM, XP, and XR. Those are genes that are predicted, uh, namely they are model from pipeline of modeling genes, right? But they still are part of RefSec. So you, whenever you look at, at the, uh, uh, or this, you already know if it's a mRNA protein or non-coding, but you know if it's a model or really physically identified mRNA sequence that you have seen. So this is the same way there is another list, which I, I don't have the time to, to go through, but that's an important one, which is the NG. G is the genome, a gene. So now it's a reference genomic sequence, right? Not the unit, but the unit is the genomic sequence. And you have also NC for the chromosome, and you have also way to know which assemble if it's just disconnected. Sometimes you have a piece of DNA that is not really connected to a full chromosome, but to a long contigue or assemble or so, or, and so on. So you have all those codes that tells you basically what, uh, uh, what is there. And I think I'll stop here. Uh, but I, I think the idea to understand that we are talking about a reference that can be used and it's included a lot of information in a very, very well formatted version. I mean, uh, way, way to, go, to go to the details. Okay, let's stop here. <laughs>